share with you a few prayer requests that you may have seen come to the email. Clyde and Jennifer Smith are asking for prayers for their niece, Tiffany Michelle's dad, Bob Goldberg, who's dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Robert Scoggins and Lida Cole's brother, Chris Scoggins, was taken to Patients Hospital today with some health issues. I don't have an update on that tonight. Robert. Robert. He's, he's getting better. He has pneumonia. Oh, oh boy. Goodness. Uh, he's improving because it's uh, free, it's oxygen level back up. Okay. Got a good message from the from Arnold and Sylvia Vaughn asking or saying thank you for all the cards, calls, and thoughts during this holiday season. They don't get out much, but um, uh, then for doctor visits, but they are usually with us uh, anytime we're live here on Facebook, and uh, they want to say thank you and that they love us all. That was updates for today. Uh, Meeting with the anthologist tomorrow. Pray for him. I have a prayer of Thanksgiving. Went to the pulmonologist on Monday, and uh, my test turned out a lot better than the first one. And I'm now <coughs> free of uh, inhalers, <coughs> unless I absolutely need them. Uh, I do have a, uh, she ordered me a uh, uh, nebulizer machine. And she said, use it if you need it. If you don't need it, don't worry about it. So I'm doing really good. I was very pleased. That's wonderful to hear, Bobby. Praise God for that. Yes. Um, Any other prayer requests tonight? Yes, I have one. All right. <clears throat> My aunt living in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, is a genuine, 100% war bride. Was married and brought back over from England. And Andy Jess, we call her Andy because of the English truth, the tradition. Andy Jess turned 97 years old today and she is doing wonderful and great health. And uh, we're very, very thankful and very, very happy for that. I see the Glens are with us online. Michael Eastman, Stephen Boone up in Huntsville, Betty Singh, Sue Ogden, Rocky Smith, Crystal, and their family. That's on Facebook. Or excuse me, YouTube. If there were no further prayer requests, then we will get started. If you'll join me to word prayer. Our Father God above, we approach your throne here in the middle part of the week, and we thank you so much for this opportunity that you have granted to us to be able to come together and to be as a family to encourage each other to lift each other up just to be with each other father and to study this another portion of your of your word father we are so thankful for for paul's letter inspired to the romans and we thank you father so much for for this opportunity that jonathan and i have to teach this great letter father i I thank you so much for Jonathan and the time and effort that he puts in studying and working with me to prepare for these lessons. And Father, I pray that if we preach or if we teach anything wrong, that you would defeat us. But I pray, Father, you would not leave us defeated, that you would help us to where that we might be able to study, learn more, and be able to teach it easy to understand, but boldly, Father. Father, we thank you so much for this congregation. We thank you so much, Father, for every single home that's represented here. And Father, I pray your blessings upon each and every one. Father, we also know that 
As I've said over and over again, as your son walked the face of the earth, he withheld healing from no one. So, Father, tonight, collectively, Father, we agree in prayer for those that we are about to lay at your throne. We know, Father, that some of these individuals are, are wanting to thank you, Father, for what you have done in their lives, Father. But others are still dealing with sicknesses, Father, and disease. Some, Father, may not be on this list, but, Father, they may be dealing with other things. They're, their hearts could be broken, Father. They could be dealing with loss of loved ones or so on and so forth. Father, we are in the right in the middle of the holiday season now. And for so many, this is a joyful time of the year. But, Father, for so many, there are memories that are not so sweet. And they deal with, with complications, Father, and depression and other things during this time of year. So, Father, I pray that you'll bless them and be with them. Father, this evening we're we are, are mindful of Peyton Alanese and Julie Atkins and Arnold Sylvia Avant and Thorbar, Kaylin Barrett and Ricky Barrett and Lada Barrios and Adria Bennett and Mary Bernard and Vince Bernhardt and Keith Block, Loretta Brandon and Aubrey, Father, Norma Brown and Cindy Burke, Linda Cantrell and Gary Clark and Wendy Coburn and Lada Cole. Father, we pray for Kevin Carmichael, Father, Clint and Judy Croft and Jean Kuba and Don and Cheryl Davis and Donald Davis, Carrie and Thomas Davis and Manuel DeFlentes. Father, we pray for Gloria Dennis and Elizabeth Denwee, for Helen Doss and Melba Doss and Judy Doty and for Lily Doty, Father, and for Janelle Dutton, Walter Eckers and Ruben Espinosa, Carlton and Judy Getty, Father, and, and Bob Goldsberg. We pray for Adrian Gonzalez and for Charlotte Grace and for Michael Graham and Gene Haas and Al and Rebecca Hastings and Aubrey Hawthorne and Cookie Hawthorne. Father, we lift up Sharon Hayes and Jessica Hazel, Leslie Hoffman and Don Hovis and Bobby Howard and Jim Humble, Heather Hudson, Father, Jerry and Pam Jones, and especially tomorrow with what Pam is going to go through with the meeting with the oncologist. Johnny Kylers and Jack Knight and Maddie Kyler. Carol Lightfoot and Colton Marshall and Cole Murphy. Amy Lawson and Larry Nice and Sue Ogden and Linda Ohm and Jen Olivia. Father, we pray for Fred Olson and Norma Jean Peck and Mary Perryman and Connie Pope and Ron Pope. Riley Porter and Tim Porter and Billy Preston. Father, we lift up Ronnie Reinhardt and Sue Rudin. Mike Rushing and the Salinas family. Father, we pray for Christ uh, Scoggin and for Mary Sewell, Elvin Simpson and the Spencer family, Millie Smith and Sam Swope. And Father, we pray for my wife, Edwina Thompson. And Father, we thank you so much for my aunt, Jessie Thompson. I pray your blessing upon her. Father, I, I pray for Bobby Thompson and for Elizabeth Thornton, Kevin Vick and Dennis and Marion Balmer and Pat Wagoner. Charlie and Dale Waller and Pam Warren, Clyde and Shirley Watson and Just and Dusty Wilson. And Father, we pray for Bob and Charlene York and for Mike and Tammy York. Father, we always pray for our own family members, those that have never named your son as their Lord and Savior, or maybe they had at one time. And now they're walking in the darkness, Father. Father, I pray that you would prick their hearts, Father, so that they may either turn to you or return to you before it's too late. We also, Father, pray for those that are still dealing with the aftermath of the coronavirus. Some people are still dealing with the virus, Father, but some still have the fresh memory of the loss of loved ones because of it. And I pray, Father, your blessing upon those individuals, Father, that are still dealing with this virus. And Father, I pray for comfort and peace for the family of Steve Corcutt and his passing. I know, Father, that there's others that are on our hearts and on our minds, and I pray that you be mindful of them as well. I pray now, Father, for your love and mercy, that you would forgive us of the sins that we have committed in our lives and bless us with love to forgive those who sinned against us. We ask you, as always, Father, to lead us not into temptation. And I pray, Father, when you call each of us home, we pray for a peaceful passing for us all. We ask all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, Cliff and I were talking this afternoon that since we had, uh, it's been, seems like a lot longer than two weeks, but it's been two weeks since we covered the first half of this material uh, yeah. that we would review for a few moments before we pick up uh, where we left off two weeks ago. So let's begin by reading Romans 10, 18 through 21, and then hopefully efficiently we can um, go back through with a bit of a review. Actually, I'm going to read this out of the CSB this time. So Romans 10, 18 through 21. But I ask, did they not hear? Yes, they did. Their voice has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that lacks understanding. And Isaiah says boldly, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I revealed myself to those who were not asking for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and defiant people. That is such a powerful passage. Okay, can anybody what, remember what we entitled this section of Scripture two weeks ago? Let's see if you, if you remember that whatsoever. Three words. The excuses, excuses, excuses. And, and to be quite honest, that is exactly what was happening here in this particular passage. You have this um, potential objection from individuals looking at the fact that Israel has forsook the salvation of God through Jesus Christ and these various excuses that are given. And what is the first excuse that we see that is put forth? What is that? Verse 18. Haven't they heard? In other words, they haven't heard. That's the problem. That's the excuse. We have not heard. Is that a true excuse? No. Um, they have heard the truth. They cannot play that card. Uh, Paul says... Uh, from the New American Standard, you may say, but I say, and again, he, he's anticipating this um, voice of this imaginary objectioner. Um, that phrase back in verse 14 was very similar, and, and Romans, uh, verse 14 of Romans chapter 9, what shall we say then? And then question mark, there is no with justice with God, is there? Question mark. And then uh, we looked at it again in, in verse 19 uh, of verse 9, he does the same thing. So he's addressing the question in the mind of the readers before the readers have a chance to make forth that question, like a good attorney, as we said uh, last week or two weeks ago. Um, Cliff kind of talked about, um, and, and I, about this hyperbole, this exaggerated statement in order to make a very profound point. And that's what uh, was happening here with the quoting of Psalm 19. If you want to go back there, uh, you can see that quotation. Most of your Bibles is going to be in italics or a different type of print to signify that this is a quotation. Well, this is a quotation of verse 19. And that phrase, their voice in the context uh, of this particular situation is referring to the voice of preachers. Their voice has gone out far and wide unto all the earth. And if you remember what we talked about, all the earth, did that mean that it reached all the way here in America? No. No. We talked about what defined all the earth, the Roman Empire wrapping around the Mediterranean Sea. That was what was on Paul's mind. And when we broke that down, we went through several areas and talked about how uh, that would have been understood, uh, took you to all these different places, uh, and then 
we talked about um, some quotes uh, Cliff shared with you. A quote from Justin Martyr, There is no people, Greek or barbarian or any other race, however ignorant of arts or and agriculture, meaning they're just scattered out in uninhabited areas, whether they dwell in tents or wander about in covered wagons, meaning nomads, among whom prayers and thanksgivings are not offered in the name of Jesus Christ, the crucified Christ, to the Father and Creator of all things. And that was in the middle of the second century. Uh, so you go out even in the middle of nowhere, and Justin Martyr says they're talking about Jesus Christ. So this message has gone out uh, pretty wide. Uh, Tertullian, talking about the Roman Empire being full of Christians, 99% uh, of the terrain in Rome, you're going to run into somebody who is a believer in Jesus Christ. And to close it up, you know, it kind of reminds me when I moved to Florence, Alabama to go to school. And it was amazing to find out that one out of every six people you ran into in Muscle Shoals or Florence, Alabama, are members of the church. And that was a far greater ratio of Christians uh, that I had ever been around. So uh, it kind of took me back to there. So let's pick up, though, uh, about Israel's accountability, Cliff. So for Paul's first point here now, folks, Israel is accountable because what? They have done what? They've heard. They've heard. And... Human responsibility before God is you must have heard or you must have have word of the the gospel. The gospel must have entered your ear. Now, folks, I want to say that every one of us tonight, whether we're either sitting in this classroom or we are online, you've heard the truth. Every single one of you and every single one of us, we have heard the truth. I am very proud to say that Jonathan and I, we literally go out of our way to make sure that as we are preparing for this class, we battle back and forth sometimes to make sure that the stuff that we pray, that we put before you to the best of our knowledge, the best of our studies is nothing but the truth. You have had, so to speak, the ace of spades. You've, you've had the ace of diamonds. You've had the, the ace of, I mean, you had a straight, all aces in your hand, folks. When you put it on the, the table, you've got a winning hand every time that, that you come to this class. There's not a single time that in my mind that Jonathan and I have not presented you with the truth. I mean, you have had the truth at the very highest level that we could possibly do using the Word of God placed before you. And now that you've got this truth, you are responsible for this truth. You cannot just take this truth and just put it down and say, okay, I've heard it. But the Bible says to do more than be hearers. It says to do what? Be doers. Be doers. Now we have a responsibility to take what we've heard and to actually be responsible for it and to do something with it, Jonathan. All right. So secondly, the first excuse was what we've just covered. But secondly, Paul's going to advance this argument uh, a little bit further. He says, after saying they have heard in verse 18... Now in verse 19 and 20, he now says, they have understood. It's one thing to hear, something else to understand, right? And Paul says, not only have you heard with your ears, you have understood with your what? Mm -hmm. With your mind. And so he says in verse 19, to take this uh, even further, but I say, and as Paul says that, that's his way of indicating, let me paraphrase it for just a moment. I know what's on your mind. How many of you are pretty good at reading people's minds? <laughs> Not hard, but... You ever thought you could read what was somebody on somebody's mind and found out you were dead wrong? <laughs> And read my own mind. 
<laughs> it's rather interesting to me that when Paul is writing this, he has the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He has something that Jesus Christ himself had in that moment of writing. What was that ability? To know what the people were thinking. To know their objections before they even are put forward. That's one of the advantages of the Holy Spirit and their ability to write was to write with all wisdom. So that's Paul's way of indicating here. I know what's on your mind. I know what you're thinking. I'm going to get out ahead of you. And what you're thinking is, well, yeah, we have heard. I'll give you that, Paul. I'll go ahead and admit we have heard, but we just couldn't connect the dots. That's the reason why we didn't obey the gospel. That's why we haven't followed Jesus Christ. Yeah, we, we've heard it all. We've heard it all from our forefathers, generations upon generations upon generations, but we just couldn't connect the dots to know that Jesus was really the Messiah. So there's our excuse. Yeah, but Jonathan, <laughs> Paul's going to head that off at the pass. Before they go any further, <laughs> this train of argument is going to stop, and he's going to derail it because he says, "He says what? What did he say? He says, surely Israel did not know, did they? I mean, he phrases it in a question, but what is the answer, folks? Of course, sure they did. Of course they understood. <clears throat> Absolutely, folks. The gospel is so simple." Only when we get involved with it do we mess it up by trying to overcomplicate it. What is it? Real quick. You are, we are a great sinner. If we're going to be a great sinner, then we need a great Savior. Great sinner needs a great Savior. Who's a great Savior that can be that Savior for us? Christ. Jesus. So, you must repent of your sins, put your faith and your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, obey the gospel, be buried in, in his name in baptism. He's the son of God. And for Israel, and this just blows my mind, he's the long-awaited promised Messiah standing right in front of them. And they... And the old saying goes, just watch him go by. I know that you understand our preaching, Paul is saying. I know that you understand everything, but the gospel is right there, and it was brought to you by the Messiah. All right, you know the word no, don't you? You know the word no, don't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> K N O W? What does it mean to know? Acknowledge. Acknowledge. Understand. Do what, Ronnie? Understand. Understand. It's one thing, as I said, to know what somebody's saying, to hear it, excuse me, but to know it. Surely Israel did not know, did they? That's out of the New American Standard. Now, the English Standard is a little bit different, but the word know in this context means understand. It's clear. And if you have an ESV, it's actually translated that way, understand, correct? Yeah. And the word means, when I break it down, means to recognize, to perceive, or to take in knowledge and to realize what is being said. So Paul is saying, not only have you heard it, you've understood. You are no doubt responsible. There's a lot of things that I hear in my lifetime that I don't understand. Anybody else in, that, in this room like that? Yes. <laughs> A few weeks ago when we were preparing this, I asked Cliff to tell me about this Artemis rocket. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever talked with Cliff about stuff like that, he'll just go, blah, 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 blah. and he'll say a lot of things, but at the end of the day, I didn't understand most of what he was saying. <laughs> it sounds cool, Cliff. 
He tried to explain all the technology behind the Artemis rocket. I could hear what he was saying, but I promise you, I wasn't understanding at all. Honest to goodness rocket science. <laughs> There's a point to that. Yes, there is. But with the gospel, you know, Paul says, surely they did not know. Did they? I love the way that, that Paul does this over and over again. And the anticipated answer is, yes, you did know, folks. You did know. You knew about Christ crucified. You knew about him being raised from the dead. You understand justification by faith. You understand that it is through grace in Christ Jesus. And so what did Paul do? <clears throat> He quotes Moses now, and then he will quote Isaiah. And it just bears our careful attention here, folks, whenever he does that, to see how he goes from point A to point B. <clears throat> and he will now quote Scripture first with Moses, to talk about God's discipline upon his own people. Why? Because they refused the gospel. And what is implied? You understood. But you didn't receive the gospel. So therefore, I'm going to have to punish you for your unbelief. That is the leap. Here's basically as we go to the Moses quote. So he is quoting what? Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. He says, first Moses says. Yeah, pay attention to that. First Moses says, not first Moses said. Most of the time when you see these quotations, you'll hear you'll see that word said, and that Says or says? Which one is present tense? Says or said? Says. says. So I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is the present tense says. In other words, guess what? It's still speaking when? Thanks. Today. It's not just what Moses said, however many years ago, over 3,000 or so years ago. He's still speaking to you today from this word. First, Moses says, I. Who's the speaker here? God. God's the speaker here. I. Not Moses is going to make you jealous. Who's going to make you jealous? God's going to make you jealous. I will make you jealous. The you, though, is referring to what group of people? Jews. The Jews. Israel is going to refer to them. In their unbelief, and God will make Israel jealous. He's going to provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy because why? Because they will see the blessings that were promised to them, and here's that big word, if they would only believe. So making them jealous you know, a lot of times we have a struggle with understanding the difference between discipline and punishment. We deal with this with our own children. We've had this conversation with our children. Not all discipline is punishment. Depends on what you're in your own. <laughs> <laughs> the point being here, he wasn't out to punish them for their unbelief in the sense of the way we look at punishment. He was out to do what to them? Get them to do what? Change, Change to believe. Yeah. It wasn't an accident he used uh, Moses and Isaiah either. No. Nope. It's like pulling out the big guns, you know. Because both groups dealt with the Jews at their at what is historically their two most obstinate points of the entire Old Testament. But then he said they will see these blessings coming to a people that they consider to be no people whatsoever. Now, who are they? The Gentiles. You're talking about making somebody jealous, quick, fast, and in a hurry. 
whenever the blessings that were supposed to come to the Jews are now going to the Gentiles, somebody's got somebody's attention real quick. He says, so I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. Oh, the Gentiles are not a nation, not to the Jews. And not a nation, whenever you look at that, literally means not really a people. And it is a very demeaning expression that the Jews had for the Gentiles. I wish there was some way that I could get across to you the, the, the complete, utterly distaste that a Gentile had for a no-life Gentile. I think, the easiest, Gentile. I think the easiest way to describe it is the way that I think we've seen, even within some of our lifetimes, how we will look at certain races of people and go, no, they're not really real. They're not really truly right. their their life is not as valuable as my life. You know, if you look at another person that's different than you and think, well, their life is not as valuable as mine, there's a good way that the Jews look at the Gentiles. They looked at the Gentiles and said, Your life is not near as valuable as mine. You don't have the intrinsic God given value that I have. And, and the Jews will see these Gentiles that they have supposed don't even exist on God's map, and now God's doing what? He's showering these blessings of salvation on these Gentiles who received the gospel that was originally promised to Israel, but Israel has turned up their nose at the gospel, and so God has brought this upon them, and he has shown them this in front of their faces and brought grace and favor to the Gentiles. I was trying to think of a way to describe it. My mother, whenever we would get a new dog and it would pee in the floor, <laughs> would take its face and rub its nose in it. I don't know if that was the bad thing to do or not. I was a kid. I just remember it. It works. It works? Okay. Well, that's essentially what God is doing to the gen to the Jews right now. He's rubbing their face in it to get them to see they're dumber than a dog because it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work, though, right? It did not. It hasn't worked. No, it did not work. Not as a whole. But, folks, here's the reality. And listen to this. They really don't want God on his terms. They want what God offers. But on their terms. But on their terms. They want the gifts. Not God himself, though. And folks, whenever you really break it down and you really look at it, it kind of sounds like that health and wealth prosperity gospel that you hear is preached. Even today. I mean, they want the goodies from God without having to deal with God himself and all of that ooh, obedience that comes with it. So they're jealous of what is coming to the Gentiles with a dis, with a absolute, utterly distaste. Yet, folks, they are responsible for their unbelief. They are suffering on their own hard heartedness. It's interesting that Paul can speak so eloquently about this because all he is doing is indicting himself and what he believes when he was known as Saul. Yes. Mm -hmm. With him being a minister to, Gen to the Gentiles, he was in an absolutely unique position. He had to have been fully repentant to be able to preach his folly to these people. And then still bring in the Gentiles. God oh, yes. is so elegant in the way he designed it. Yes. And what and basically what are they doing? They are suffering because they have refused that gospel. Cliff. Sir. Is it much different than that today? Oh yes. No. We want <laughs> we want Christ, we want salvation, but we want to do it our way. And if we don't like 
what he tells us to do, we either blank it out or write it out or come up with some new rules that that's not what it really means. Or a different translation in the Bible. Or a different translation. We're a stubborn people. <coughs> Jonathan, he must be talking about Jesus because he ain't talking about Jesus. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. We want our cake and we want to eat it too. Yeah. But we don't want to. We don't want to go through all the problems that we have to do to make that cake. We don't want to put out the effort. We don't want to put out the the, the effort. And that does. Speak you know, I, I think it. I think it though. There's a, a, the the root goes deeper than that. I think the root is. Is that we want to think the way we want to think. Yeah. We don't want anybody to change our mind. Because the moment you change my mind on something, then I have to admit what? Wrong. And that is, I mean, you, obstinance to the core. When you accept Jesus Christ, though, you have changed your mind. That you you have to. Yes. And when so when you accept him and you begin to follow it, and your mind has been changed. But now take what you just got through saying now and put yourself right in the place of what a Jew is. Well, I don't understand Jews. No, but they have they have the law of Moses. They've been God's people. They don't have anything to repent of. They don't have mind. anything to repent of. They're perfect because maybe, Abraham is my father. And maybe that's why they were crucified in Germany. Well, they, you know, you just don't know. What's... If you hear them, you know, if if you listen to them, whenever Jesus is arguing with them or Jesus is talking to them, first thing they said, right out of their mouth, we have Abraham as our father. That's the justification for everything. And I would like to clarify, I don't think every Jew had that obstinance. No, I don't think so either. I think the religious leaders that Jesus dealt with were very obstinate of that nature. But I think it was quite possible that many of the common Jews, um, there had to have been many <laughs> common-minded Jews um, that weren't as obstinate in their mindset. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been 3,000-plus souls on the day of Pentecost. To, I wonder what the percentage of Christian Jews are just today. I mean, you know, the Jews converted from uh, Christians converted converted from Judaism yeah people that were people that are Jews I think it would depend on the I think it would depend uh, somewhat on the geographical area you, if, if you live in an area where there are very few um, Jewish are individuals who have uh, their descendancy of a Jewish nature if you have very few then it would be you know very very small but even in a in an area such as let's just say um, where would you think the largest population of Jews in our country are? New York City. New York City. Houston's not. Yeah, now they're in Florida. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't believe that the percentage would be very high. But God said he'd always save a remnant. But if you go back and if you study the New Testament, as Johnson said, yes, the high up, but the common there was common Jews that still followed Jesus. By the way, that remnant is not speaking of Jewish remnant. It's we are the new Israel. We are the remnant. So make sure you understand that. He's not saying that he was going to save a, a remnant of the Jews, specifically the Jews. The remnant contained is the nation, the new Israel. We're the new Israel. I took it as he's saving the Christians. Yep. Whether they're Jew or whether a Jew or Gentile. Jew, they'll save a remnant. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, that word remnant, when compared to the whole, it's a relatively small number, right? Yes. Well, as if this stuff doesn't go deep enough, then uh, Paul quotes the rest of Deuteronomy 32, 21. He says, by that, which is not a nation, by a nation. <laughs> Folks, it's not as hard as maybe we make it out to be because... The word nation just simply means a people, and it's collectively referring to the Gentile people. And he says, by a nation without what? Understanding. A nation without understanding will I anger you. 
So as they continue in their unbelief, Israel, as they suffer for their own rejection of their own Messiah, rather than it humbling them and bringing them to repentance, it actually has the opposite effect and only makes them even more angry. It's almost like when someone asks the question, and I've heard this so many times in my life, Jonathan, will people in hell, will they ever repent? Won't they finally come to their senses and humble themselves? The answer is no. Folks, if you look at the scripture, they only get even more angry in hell. That's why the Bible describes it using the phrase of the gnashing of teeth. You know what that means? You ever studied that phrase? You're actually gritting your teeth in anger and fury against God. So the hardened heart only becomes what? Harder and harder. And, and Paul's just saying, listen, listen, family, you're doing this to yourselves. You are the one who's becoming angry with God. And, and the whole time, the more angrier and angrier you get, the whole time God is standing there with what? His arms, His arms outstretched to you all day long to come to him in faith and repentance. Paul said, that's what's taking place here. And when you hear him say, a nation without understanding. <laughs> Folks, that's how the Jews basically referred to the Gentiles at, at that particular point. And not only are they not a people, they don't have any understanding either. I mean, my goodness gracious alive, folks. That's what the Jews thinks about the Gentiles. They don't have the prophets. They don't have the covenants. They don't have the oral traditions. Yeah, they don't have the genealogy. They don't have the scriptures. Folks, they don't have any understanding at all. And yet, Look what God is doing with his blessings because of what they're doing with their heart. I think it's hard for some of us in this room to know how they were feeling. Yeah. But Israel is, is seeing what is becoming quite expediently, very fast, very quickly, a Gentile church. And by the way, Paul is the apostle to what group of people? The Gentiles. You see one of your biggest champions turn his back and now become the champion of the very race of people that you thought have no understanding? That's going to make you what? Angry. Angry. Furious. I guess the only way I could try to describe it would be like a child who has a toy and another little baby is put nearby, and that, that baby or that child takes the other child's toy, and now you got a brouhaha going on, don't you? You had everything you know taken away from you. Yeah. And they were, they were told by God that they were a special nation, they set apart from the whole other nations, and given all these blessings and promises, and now his love, is for the church. That's right. It's a whole new nation now. You know, it's, it's where their faith is. It's, it's, they're not first anymore like they used to be in the Old Testament. You know, when you break it down, the best way to surmise the way that, that their their mindset was at this moment is, is these are the people who don't know anything. Why would God be good to them? <coughs> And that's that's what's going on here in their minds. Look at Romans 10, verse 20. 
because in Romans 10, verse 20, Paul's going to add another cross-reference, basically to heighten the, the responsibility that Israel has. And look what he starts out. And Isaiah is very bold and says, what that means is Isaiah is even bolder than what Moses was. And Isaiah puts it even stronger. And so now he quotes Isaiah 65, verse 1. And basically all I'm doing is just following Paul's train of thoughts here and Paul's logic. So let's read this. We read, I was. Who is I? God. God is still the speaker here, folks. That's very important. God's still the, 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 the speaker. I was found by those. And who are the those there? Gentiles. Gentiles. It refers to the Gentiles. Who did not seek me. And this is something of a kind of a prophetic reality of what is or was to come. Because remember when Israel had the gospel, what did they do with it? They just hoarded it. And when we use the word gospel, you got to remember not only, you know, we look at the gospel, which is the saving news of Jesus Christ, but there are other usages of the word gospel the basic way you say gospel means what good news, good news. okay so with that train of mind keep going there we see you know for example this good news that we're talking about and and you're and you want to see an example of, about hoarding it god told noah to go preach jonah jonah i mean not sorry about that jonah to go preach the gospel to to where Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh must have been a big city because he walked for, what was it, three? And only got to the middle of it. <laughs> but before he got to Nineveh, what did he do? He got on a ship. He went the other direction. Yeah, kind of like, okay, Cliff, we need you to go to, I had a a buddy of mine one time that he and I was flying to Chicago and as we walked up to the um, the counter he set one bag he said I want this to go to New York and he set another bag up he said I want this to go to my Miami and I want my third bag to go to San Francisco and the little counter person looked at it and said but Mr. Wayne Scott you're going to Chicago he said, yeah, but if my bags go to those places, maybe they'll wind up in Chicago with me this time. <laughs> so it, it, it would be kind of like me going to out to Intercontinental and say, I want, God tells me you go to New York and, and I catch that next flight going to L.A. No, I'm not going. No, 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 no. I'm going in the opposite direction. Why? Because I don't want those people up in New York to have the gospel. They're just not worth saving. And that's what Jonah did. And then after they are saved, you remember what Jonah did? Yeah. He goes and gets under a plant, and all he does is pout because they got converted. He just wanted to hoard the whole thing for himself or themselves, in this case, for the little nation of Israel, Folks, that's not an unusual attitude. It probably, I think, the story of Jonah, to me, accurately represents the nation of Israel at this time. They didn't want the Gentiles to get in on this good thing. It's kind of like you got a secret, and you don't want anybody else to get in on this real estate deal that you know about. You just want to. Keep it for yourself. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> so in reality, this is kind of a prophecy. That's what Jesus hammered his Pharisees on, right? Not only did you 
not want to hear my words. You don't want anybody else to hear my words. Well, the prophecy of the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ is, is what this is basically is. Israel doesn't want to share this with the Gentiles. So the Bible says, I was found by those who did not seek me. Now, who were those? The Gentiles. Now, here in the irony, folks, no, the Gentiles were not seeking him, but who else? Who, who else was not seeking him, really? The Jews. The Jews. The Jews. Well, Even they, Israel. Weren't they seeking him, but they just didn't accept the fact that Jesus was him. They may have been seeking They were seeking, the seeking their own Messiah. Yeah, right. seeking, There's a big difference in seeking. Yeah, they were seeking their own Messiah. Yeah, the, the big difference in seeking the Messiah. and They were seeking a king to come and save them and rule the earth. That's, that's right. right. Exactly. An earthly king. They wanted their own self-righteous religion. And that is why you have the Pharisees who are just self-righteous up to the top of their head. And that's why you have got the Sadducees <laughs> who were the liberals back then, folks. And that's why you got the scribes and all these different little pockets of people all over the place there. They weren't seeking God. They weren't seeking the Messiah. <clears throat> they were seeking a self-made religion of their own way to God. He says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. You know, when I think about that phrase, I mean, I try to figure out what, what God's saying here. It's, it's, Basically, I had to make myself known to the Gentiles or they would have never found out about me because you weren't going to tell them about me. But I've been with you all along. God is saying to these Jewish people, all you had to do was open your eyes, and open your ears. You didn't even have to walk across the street. I've been with you this whole time. It's the Gentiles who didn't even know about me. I had to go and manifest myself to them. That's what he just read, right? I was under your nose all along. How much more responsible then could you possibly be? I think we know the answer to that, don't we? You heard it. You understood it. And now you are suffering because you didn't respond to it. But here's the key. You can't lay the blame. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. You can't lay the blame. God is saying, you can't lay that blame with me. That's your own doing. Those are the choices you made. And so because of that, I have made, I have became manifest to those who didn't ask for me. A lot to this. Folks, do, do y'all have any question? I mean, Johnson and I have been talking about how deep that this was. And you literally have to put yourself in the mind's eye of people that you do not realize the the complete utter distaste that they have for somebody else but you really need to put yourself in that mind's eye in order to understand even more what paul is not only dealing with here but what paul's trying to get the point across to them and it's like we've been said tonight we have to be very careful because we have some of that same thing and that same mentality today do you know of anybody who that you have said in your mind they don't need the gospel Ooh, i got to be careful here. I might be stepping on somebody's toes because I'm guilty of that. And that's exactly what that the Jews is doing here. <clears throat> I can't believe you would do this to the Gentiles because they don't deserve it. They don't need it. It could be absolutely they wrong. With hate in their heart. Do what, Ronnie? Didn't they act like that with the hate in their heart? 
Man, I tell you, I would almost say yes. Seems like it. Because of that that utterly distaste that they have for somebody. Is it easy to feel like God is on your side when the blessings are just really flowing? Oh, sure. What if in the next 15 or 20 years, all the riches and all the abundance that we have in this country are gone. That's possible. Do you think people will be as quick to believe that that we are that we are as quick to believe that God is on our side? Or may it be that we might start to wonder, well, God given up on us? See, when, when when you see God blessing somebody else, sometimes does that not make you do a self-examination? It ought to. Or oh, likely that they're to blame. There you go. Well, how? Define blessing. Oh, it's such a hard thing to describe. <laughs> because every blessings are subjective to the beholder, if you know what I mean yeah. by that. But we've become accustomed to a certain level. Yeah. <laughs> you could also look at it as if you see somebody else with a blessing, be happy for them. Yeah. And the Bible tells us to do that. Rejoice with those who are rejoicing. The point being, that's not happening here. It's not happening in this particular passage, is it? Is a warm bed a blessing from God, or is the focus of man on making money and focusing on getting that warm bed? Yes. Even, even Jesus himself, what does it say? Don't you think God ever gave us everything? You know, everything that we have today, whether it be materialistic or, or spiritual, came from God. It's a blessing from God, in my opinion. And, and the Bible makes it clear, you know, uh, God's blessings flow on all people. I mean, it's it's not a situation where you can look right now at a certain part of the world and say, well, the reason they're, they're, they're not blessed at all by God. Well, our nation is blessed by God because they're right with what God says. But even by religion, we started and we still are here in the most country. Well, if you go back to the day of slavery, if you take this and you think about what they're doing here, and when we had slaves in this country, they were not a nation. No, a very similar mindset. Very similar mindset. If we're exactly. if we're just going to be honest, that's a very similar mindset. Right. That's what I was thinking of all this time. That it happened right here in our own country. Just what these Jews are doing. It's it's always been the, one of those complex thoughts in my mind when I study history that there have been so many moments throughout history where one race uh, or multiple races have, have looked at themselves as being vastly superior to another. That one particular race or group of people are, as this particular passage says, of no understanding, little value of life. And um, I think this is a, a fair warning to us all, even today, not to judge people based on where they came from, even when it comes to reaching people with the gospel, even with our own community, you can look at certain people and go, they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. I'm not just talking about race. I'm talking about clothing. I'm talking about dirty social staff. Social staff. I mean, boy, we can, we can play this same game with God when it comes to those people. And it's just as devastating when we do it in that way as it is in this way, in my mind. Maybe me personally, sometimes it's not that I don't, in my mind, think everybody needs God, because obviously they do, but sometimes you think, well, this person, they're probably not going to change anyway, or they're not, it's not worth the effort. And I mean, subconsciously, you yeah. think 
Yeah. You know what I try to remind myself sometimes when I'm when I'm I'm tempted to do that as well. I don't think we're alone in that. Is the gospel is so powerful. God's word is so powerful that there's not a single one of us on this earth that it is incapable of piercing to the heart of that individual. And I have to remind myself of that because if I don't then I put the onus on myself to be the one to make the change in that person's life. And I know I can't do it, but I better not, I better stop being willing to. But that's a judging. Yeah. It's judging. Is what but I, I'm telling you, it, it's something we have to be careful of. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, we're grateful for your grace and mercy upon us. As we've read tonight, we, we too, even in this room, we can be an obstinate an unrepentant, uh, disrespectful, unloving people from time to time. And if it was not for your grace, none of us in this room would have hope. But Father, you looked upon us even when we were dead. And Father, there's not much value in dead. But you saw value in us enough that you sent your son to die on that cross to give us the hope of salvation, to raise us from death to life, just as your son was raised to life. So that, Father, one day, too, we could be assembled with you just the way that your son is there at your right hand right now. One day we can be rejoined together. And, Father, be the people that you've called us to be. But, Father, until that moment, we've got a lot of work to do. And I pray that we're servants of yours and that we are sowing the seed of your gospel, that we're not hoarding it, that we're not misplacing it, but that we are sharing it with all that, that you place into our paths. Be with this class, Father. Be with them as they leave here tonight. Please keep everyone safe. Please continue to give everyone health and ability to do your will this week as we serve you. It's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.